Good afternoon, Alicia. How are you? Hi. I'm How's good. Things? How are you? Let's yeah, pretend we... we haven't been speaking for five minutes. I know. Let's, <laughs> let's have a chat about that. So um, yeah. thanks ever so much for um, joining us. Uh, we've had a few blips trying to get together, and that's uh, schedules and all, and all the rest of it. So I like, yeah. really appreciate it that you've come on board and... Um, and, and, you know, are going to spend some time with us and talking about what you get up to and what your process is and all the rest of it, because uh, we've mm -hmm. been doing these for quite a long time now. And we get lots of photographers come on board and and uh, they they got <laughs> quite popular. And we've had a little bit of a hiatus because I wanted to kind of think it through a little bit better because uh, mm -hmm. we were doing a lot all in one go. So mm -hmm. uh, just so everybody understands that from now on, we, we're going to try and do two a week maximum. And uh, if you are watching this right now, just say hello, put some comments in the box underneath, say hello, where you're from, what you're doing. If you've got any questions for Alicia Bruce, that'd be fantastic. So uh, Alicia, where are you right now on the planet? On the planet, I'm in Portobello in Edinburgh, which is Edinburgh seaside. <laughs> um, and I'm in my office, which is in my house. All I can imagine right now is that we should have done <laughs> Or had the uh, train spotting music in the background. Because is that right? That's kind of that area where that was uh, set, right? Portobello yeah, leaf. And leaf in that way. Leaf. Yeah. Yeah. So not far from here, but yeah. maybe I haven't seen train spotting too yet. But maybe Portobello's in that. I'm not sure. Well, I know that a lot of it was actually filmed in Glasgow. And there mm -hmm. were a few sort of scenes done in Edinburgh, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I was just trying to set the scene because what we're trying to find out a lot from photographers is their location. We were trying desperately not to be uh, so London all the time. So it's really good mm -hmm. to hear that, you know, where your location, where you're from and what, you know, the, the, your kind of um, your ge geography that's around yeah. you. Yeah. So um, I'm not from yeah. Edinburgh. I'm from Aberdeen, which is further north, but I've lived here for 16 years. So. Okay. Okay, so you're pretty settled there. It's not somewhere that you were. You're not going to go back to Aberdeen just yet, yeah. Um. Well, we own the house, so I'm hoping that we'll stay here. And we like yeah. the beach. So. <laughs> yeah, I love Edinburgh. Uh -huh. Edinburgh is fantastic. Yeah. And brilliant. would you say that there's quite? Uh, is there a, is there a good photography scene near Edinburgh? Yeah, yeah, there is, and um, in Scotland in general, there's a lot going on in Scotland. It's not just Central Belt. There's um a few festivals up north like St Andrew's Photo Festival, Flow Photo Festival um, yeah and there's good photo scenes in Edinburgh, Glasgow yeah I was at Stills and, last night oh right okay and it was so um, do you feel that you've got quite a community around you there, there's quite a few yeah. Ed, Ed, more Edinburgh based photography network that that is um do you guys all get together does is it quite close do you help each other out yeah pretty much well we used to me and um a couple of pals used to go to Arl and share a house together while we were there and we do we've got like kind of there's different like pots of people that we hang out with there's a lot of photography people in my local area um I can hear myself echoing a little bit here um which is good and then there's a lot of us in Edinburgh different types of people you meet for different reasons you know like female photographers will meet up together or like there's bigger gangs of us and then there's also the online community which is awesome I think, yeah and you, you, you seem to be pretty connected to that because I, I I'm uh remember that we come into contact online online first and then oh. you were down in London at an event oh, God, oh, oh maybe what we was did. it yeah it was photo that, eight. it was it looked... eight. okay yeah okay. And, and... <laughs> you're oh, missing you yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that, yeah, and we had a photo in that each and kind of thing because that was a great um, yeah. community yeah. network here in London, and I I got really, mm -hmm. um, I got really immersed in that. I like John Levy. I think he's a great guy, and and yeah. um, and it's a shame there that, that didn't, didn't carry on. Oh, there we go. There I am. Brilliant. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, and, and and what was really good was that uh, I'd it suddenly for for me. I mean, I like. Personally, I love photography, and I, I'm, my background is press photography, okay? Mm -hmm. So I come from the Fleet Street end of things, and it's all quite masculine and aggressive. So mm -hmm. what I really liked was that these uh, communities opened a door for me because I love photography, and I, I sh was mm -hmm. always shooting my own stuff and projects mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, and it just opened this door on a bunch of people that I'd never come into contact with mm -hmm. and, yeah. or, could, or could see. It was, uh, that's what I really love about it. So, but I'm lucky. I'm from London. I'm from the big metropolis. So, um, did you always <laughs> feel kind of lucky? <laughs> yeah. 
But did you always feel like that you weren't connected to it? Have you found it difficult to um, um, get your stuff shown or become part of something? Have you felt detached? Um, at points, yeah, but we all do at points. I felt detached when I was on maternity leave in some ways. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a funny one. I think um, things like street level in Glasgow are brilliant and Malcolm, the director, is brilliant. And in 2009, I wasn't long out of uni and I'd just done this big residency he gave me a bursary to go to rhubarb rhubarb have you heard of rhubarb rhubarb I have, you know? I have heard of it yeah and um that really opened my eyes to you know what I could do with my work I guess because social media wasn't such a big thing then and it it sort of opened my eyes to so many like-minded people that were everywhere you know and and that was really fantastic I made really good friends there and you know met people I don't think I was ready in a lot of ways to show work at it but Louise Clements who I met last night I met her there that was oh okay nine, nine years ago nine years yeah. ago um Brian Griffin who I've always always admired I remember him coming and picking up my portfolio and looking at it I was like oh, Brian yeah wow Brian Griffin <laughs> um so that that for me was a big springboard but um I always felt like I've had a photo community here, but then yeah. in Scotland, there's the arts and photography kind of are parallel in some ways, but then photography is, the photography world is its own place from art fairs, if that makes sense, you know, the photo festivals and, and the dialogue that we have and the things that we do. So I like to be in, in both camps in yeah. a sort of way. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that. I think it's it, sometimes it's a difficult one because you're um, location wise and and the rest of it just to try mm. and keep connected in some format. I mean, I watched you a little bit on I was tagged into a few things and uh, like watching how uh, it works with. Uh, <coughs> interestingly, uh, and I'll, uh, the, the the location wise thing only dawned on me after i'd stopped watching what was happening online on twitter i mm. think this was and uh it was like you in edinburgh and then it was uh grant scott he's down in sort of west country bristol, area, bristol and bath yeah. that way and oh, he's moved uh, us, he? yeah jim mottram is in norfolk mm -hmm. and i was in london so yeah. it only dawned on me afterwards i was like bloody hell that's like that's that's amazing because mm -hmm. it was just this little convo, but it was, it was quite a big, you know, such a decent connection. But via mm -hmm. via ge geography, it does blow my mind a little bit. So yeah, uh, I think you'd be really struggling uh, in a way, you know, to 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 get on. You know, I can't think of anything without the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can't, I can't. I know how how you know. I know how hard it was prior to the internet. You know, mm -hmm. which makes me sound really old, but I'm not. But um. <laughs> So uh, Grant has come online and Grant says the support Hi, for uh, photography you have in Scotland is something we need in England. So there oh, again. Move here. Yeah, Grant. <laughs> yeah. Move again. He's only moved like three times in the last year or something. That's Sometimes. right. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that it's um, it, it, I think maybe because in England that we do have it is a bit more kind of spread you don't it it's not you don't get that intensity like people in the, you, how you described all the Scottish uh, photographers banding together uh -huh. There's a, a lot more because I noticed this as well in Ireland uh, I, I was in Ireland a lot with photography uh -huh. in uh, in the Republic and I noticed that as well I noticed uh -huh. that as well it's just Wales as well. Different. oh in Wales as well yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, because when I met you, I was doing a residency in Cardiff. Not in oh. Cardiff, in the Valleys. I wasn't in Cardiff at all. I was in the Valleys in Blenavon, which is a quite remote Welsh place, but quite near to Newport. And there's a lot of um, Welsh photographers and there's a history of Welsh photography in the Valleys and the kind of yeah. ex-mining yeah. towns and that sort of thing. And they've got a really beautiful connection and dialogue going on there too. In fact, yeah. there was a... I'm, I'm going to get this wrong and I hope someone puts me right when they listen to this because I can't remember the name of the photographer who shot it originally. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling it was someone like Robert Kappa mm -hmm. photographed a Welsh mining village and this was like in the 40s or 50s and somebody's gone back. Yeah, and he did. Was it Kappa? I'm sure Kappa did. If you ask, I don't know if he's there. David Drake, are you there? Um, because there was an exhibition the Valleys represented and I'm 
pretty sure. And uh, my memory okay. does come in sometimes. Because there some... were things by Robert Kappa and Robert Frank, maybe? It might be Robert Isn't Frank, even. But there's some clever dick who's going around at valleys, photographing the locations again, and uh. sometimes with the people in it. Ah. And is I, that... I was like, wow, that's really cool. I can't that remember Pitney? that. Uh, John uh, Pitney? Maybe. Oh, it might be. It might yeah. be. Could be. Oh, it is. It is. Um, here we go. Hey. Thanks very much, Grant. Um, Grant, as he is the font of all knowledge. <laughs> he is. Bruce Davidson, hey. originally, and John Pountney uh, totally. as well. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, and John, um, John's recently done a residency in Blenavon, where I was. So it's been nice, oh, okay. kind of sad in some ways, because a lady that we both photographed passed away, and that that was so sad. But also to have that kind of connection, he could tell her messages from me, and yeah, hearing about his work there, it was nice. It's nice to be part of a lineage. That yeah, way. yeah. I think it. I think it is. There's something. I think. I find it quite. I find it quite exciting. Yeah, John Pountney is doing the pictures. Says Grant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I think this is a uh, family member, Claudette. No, no. Hi, Claudette Bruce. No, we're not related. Okay. She's laughing at me though. <laughs> it's just, it's just what a did lot I do? Of uh, knocking around in there. And thank uh, Natasha's on online. Hello, Natasha. Shameless, shameless, shameless oh, cool. self promotion. Brilliant. Uh, I'm also a photographer. Cover the anti-Trump protests on Friday and the anti-fascist demo in Whitehall on Saturday. Link to my page here. There you go. It's Fields of Light Photography. It's on Facebook. Good work. I'll have Facebook. a look after if that's okay, Natasha. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's good to know. I was not there photographing that one. So Cheers yeah, for that, Natasha. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if you're all watching at the moment, you've got any questions for Alicia, please do stick them into the comments box underneath. And what we're going to do, we're, we're just going to carry on talking. While you're thinking of a question, stick it into the uh, box underneath and uh, I'll, we'll come back to it as we go. OK, so uh, Alicia, you, we were talking a little bit about the valleys. OK, so what I thought might be quite a good move would be. Um, let's uh, let's have a go with. Getting some of that up on the screen, shall we? So um, can you explain to us a little bit more about the. Uh, why, what happened with your residency, how that came about? That came up, I applied for it. It was an open call for um, photographers to revisit Photo Gallery's Valleys Archive, which is a tradition of them commissioning photographers to go and make work in the valleys. Um, people like David Bailey, Peter Fraser um, went in the 70s. So this was like a kind of, it had stopped for a few decades. And I applied and was just really lucky to get it. Um, it wasn't just me, there was um, Sean Edwards, who's an artist, he's now, Sean is representing Wales in the Venice Biennale this year, he makes a lot of work about this okay. thing, um, and Louise, who assisted me in the Valleys project, she's project managing part of that, which is cool, and um, a guy called, is it Zhao Ring, I can never quite pronounce his name, or Robert Zhao, and he did a beautiful book about Glenavon, we were all there sort of at separate times, um, and he has his project is called the Institute of Critical Zoologists. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a, a fine art photographer. Very cool. Um, so three of us I, were I, I like anything selected. that's to do with uh, animals and anthropology and that is in connection yeah. with, with, with things. I, I'm a big fan of Chris Morris and he, you know, ah, the cool. uh, comedy, comedy guy uh, with Brass Eye and the day to day and all that kind of thing. And in fact, that was uh -huh. his, that was his subject at uni he was a oh, right, okay. so anything ah, and then, then so look see, up robert's work thing because you'll probably like it anything that comes out of it you can see it all in the creative work and that kind of thing and the reference mm -hmm. points anyway mm -hmm. carry on cool. sorry I, uh, yeah in, in, so wales yeah i went down to cardiff first time i'd gone to cardiff was for an interview and literally i just um twitter's interest in here it was the first um few weeks i'd been on twitter and um, yeah, I was just so excited to be in Cardiff and you get, it's a bit like Glasgow in some ways, you get that kind of yeah. energy vibe when you get there. And I didn't think that I would get the residency, to be honest. I was just like, oh, well, I'll enjoy my is day it, out and see what happens. More, uh, <laughs> in, in Cardiff that I've found that there's a lot more singing in harmony. Yeah, in Glasgow, male voice they can't quite nail, like, they can't oh, quite okay. nail that down. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. <laughs> depends on the drink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, depends yeah. on the podcast. 
But I went to an interview at Chapter, Chapter Art Centre with David Drake and Lisa from Photo Gallery and spoke through my proposal, which was all based on a painting by, here it is, by William Dice, who was an Aberdeen-born artist, a figurative painter, and he'd gone to Wales in about 1850, so round about the birth of photography, and he'd made this painting, which um, that's a photo, one of the photographs that's based on the painting, but the painting was figurative, rural. It looked like an early Photoshop sort of way. There was just something jarring about the painting and something that I wanted to explore. But also I was had quite ill health at the time. Mm -hmm. And William Dice had gone to Wales for a change of air and for his his well-being and things like that. And I thought, oh well, maybe maybe a bit of fresh air will help me. I wasn't it was a physical unwellness that I had, but yeah, anyway crazy romantic notion that I could go to Wales and it would all be magical and I could kind of use this painting as a starting point to have conversations with members of a rural community and start to make photographs with them based on on this painting. So it was like a connection between where I'm from, where they're from, that sort of thing. And then I was there for three months. Yeah. So make and work for three months. So can, can we can we talk a little bit about, can we talk a little bit about your the um, connection with art okay because I I do see that there is a big connection with you with art and and yeah. you've just you've just mentioned it there so could we can we talk a little bit about that because you're obviously influenced by uh, mod, modern artists I would say is that right yeah, am, I, do you I, think... am I wrong but I, <laughs> I get the I get the feeling that there's a there's a little bit of a crossover and and how that comes across in in your image making yeah what well, i do i love i love art and i love contemporary art as well but um the thing that i'm always drawn back to in my own research my own practice is like figurative painting that seems to all have all happened within the same few decades which also seems to be around about the same time as the birth of photography mm -hmm. um or there's been some sort of lens-based element in making those artworks, but that was never conscious. That's just something that I've kind of picked up on over time. Um, but yeah, painting, I think it- You mean it's, it's come out in the wash kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, ah, well, you can't choose what you're drawn to. You're just drawn to it. And that's what, that's what fascinates me. Um, and yeah i guess it's just like i'm always trying to make things that are a bit past a bit present a bit familiar a bit unfamiliar and yeah. for me the because my work's really collaborative and because i work with communities and it can it can seem quite big i don't i don't take photojournalism style snaps i like to involve the person that i'm photographing as much as possible and sometimes having an artwork or something in your hand that you can discuss or they can take home and stick up on their fridge or in their bedroom they can go away and think about, well, what's my role in this image? What do I want to be? Yeah. How do I, how do I want to present myself to the world? That sort of thing. So I guess it comes from that a little bit. Also that I I love painting and not all my work's like that. It kind of, but it, it comes back again and again. So yeah, and even like the, um, the Digging for Diamonds exhibition, which is um, on my website as well, even then, like I made all these portraits in a shed. I had a shed studio for a year of all the plot holders in these allotments, and they were all based kind of loosely on Rembrandt paintings and Vermeer paintings, the stick painting in my shed studio, and they would come and have a look at them. And that the lighting and things like that was the main starting point for that. But then that was the stage, and they could come and bring an object from their from their shed or a vegetable or whatever and we would discuss it and discuss them yeah and then make a portrait so yeah i don't know if i'm making much sense but that's yeah you are yeah I, <laughs> because i'd see it when it's just interesting to hear about what you're like how you approach it because it's like uh you love art and, and the rest of it and it when mm -hmm. I mentioned it comes out in a the wash then sometimes you are you don't um it's involuntary so you're taking pictures and you might frame things in a certain way or, or mm -hmm. the viewpoint and the rest of it or you're totally on it and are going to emulate a, a, a painter or a painting yeah not I, exactly I, I, though no i think it's more to kind of echo the past but then the present's really important so yeah it, it's not about paying tribute to the painter necessarily it's about kind of um, being complimentary maybe no 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 it's um it's about appropriating 
the content in the context of that, but then bringing in something else which sort of subvert, subverts it or adds, I don't know. One of my friends, Robert Powell, who's an artist, he um, always says when he looks at my work, he always doesn't know if things are going to get better or worse because there's that sort of tension in the work, which I quite like. I like that comment. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> No, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Uh, I understand. I had, that I've not had much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm going to do, I'm going to breeze through this album from the valleys. Okay, okay. If, you, if you can um, maybe uh, run a little bit of commentary. Oh, yeah. So Sheila, that's the lady that John and I both photographed um, in her. This is Sheila's um, Hawkins corn store. This was her pet food shop, which was in the next chapel in Blenavon in the town. So this is like part of, if you see the window at the back there, yeah, that's where people came in and the counter was just there. And she she worked there with her cat, Freddie lived there. So Freddie had to be in the picture because she had a dog at home, I think a German Shepherd, um, but the cat and dog had never met. So the dog lived in their house, the cat lived in the, the pet food shop where everyone came and got their pet supplies. Um, and I wanted to make a portrait that just, because she's one of these people you know, these sort of characters aren't, you know, kind of around so much anymore. And I just, I loved yeah. Sheila and I loved hanging out with her in in her shop. And I would just go in and have a laugh. I didn't really know anyone in Blenavon. So we got on well and I was like, listen, I'd really like to take a proper portrait of you. And she's like, okay, love. And I went to the National Museum of Wales and met the curator there. And we made a short list together. But this one in Wales was the name of it. Sounds quite tweet. It was on the wall in the in the National Museum, and I just thought that's so Sheila, and we could just, you know, I could set up a composition in her shop where we're pretty much not changing a thing. Yeah. And then she just has to do what she does and read her book, so she doesn't feel that things are too much upon her. But I think it really, it captures a moment in time in twenty eleven, which is very Sheila, but it could have been nineteen thirty. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. In, in fact, we've got uh, like. Il Elisa. Oh, thank you. Elisa Stack, she's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful image. Thanks for joining she us, She makes Elisa. great work too. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and this is quite good. I just <laughs> want to refer back it. to this because Kirsten Hacker, she is, uh, she is, uh, she oh. can correct me, but she's from Anglia Ruskin Uni and runs the, the course She's uh, oh. runs the course there. I think, and I do apologise, Kirsten, because I haven't replied to you that yet, but I have been away on holiday and had a little hiatus and I'm going to come straight back to you. So thanks ever so much for dropping in. It, she says, it feels like you have a visual reference library, which I completely get. Thank and you. Uh, these references echo through your work. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Completely, yeah, spot on. Uh, I, yeah. I just wanted to uh, drop in on that. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to yeah. sort And it's all about. Let's forward through these. Sorry. Can we no, go, go back to Sheila? Sorry. I'm being a control freak now. Um, it's also worth looking at the pictures and thinking about all the symbolism. You know, there, there's the instant image, but then there are things in there that are for just me and just her that people yeah. may or may not see. And okay. then we are, we arrange the space together. She's got all these old calendars, you know, the trade calendars and stuff. And yeah. then this bird's custard advert, she gave that to me the day I left Wales. Did you really? like, yeah, because I loved it. I love vintage adverts. And yeah. yeah, she said, you know, you have that. So it's up in her kitchen. Um, and fantastic. I, I sent a picture to John Putney to say, oh, show this to Sheila. I've still got this. It's up in my kitchen. I just, Is that right? so for me, there's a bit of Sheila. Sheila's come up again and again in my work. I keep meeting people called Sheila. Um, but yeah, for me, that's a very Sheila thing. But everything about that, a red jumper. You'll notice in John's picture, she's got that red jumper on as well. There's, you know, there's kind of auto history and then there's more kind of layered level histories. It's Sheila's, uh, Sheila's uniform. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh, she's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love. I I really love this stuff. I mean, um, oh, I have. I love. Uh, I my family owned a old people's home, and uh, really? yeah, a care home. So I grew up around um, going. My grandparents ran it, and then my uncle and auntie ran it, and then because uh, it was a hotel before that, before they turned it into a care home. But so I grew up around old people, and mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, very old people and so I was always really mega intrigued about them and uh, 
there was a there's always um I'm, i always gravitate to them so i was really interested in seeing a lot of these pictures and yeah. um, because i and uh, I, I, I tend to talk to them if you know what i mean mm. uh, more than i'm taking pictures i'll just sit there chatting yeah oh i've always got biscuits everywhere i've always got <laughs> biscuits like <laughs> oh, wait, and, pink yeah, not even that I'm, part of my practice <laughs> is getting to know people and yeah, you know, yeah like meeting them that's the whole thing about photography is getting to know people and hearing more about them so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just constantly bringing biscuits to people <laughs> um, but you're saying that about the old folks home this is the thing about george spencer who you see here who's an amazing character as well he sadly passed away a couple oh. of years ago um and sheila they never were in old folks homes they never went to retirement homes do you know they worked their days out sheila retired i think just weeks before before she passed and george really? was the same and george i went to see him when i had my exhibition in wales because you can own and sheila and a lot of the other people in the eleven because he didn't even have a letterbox i don't i need to check that but he didn't have a phone in the shop Oh. And then um, the only way you can get in touch with George is to go and see him. He wants to see you. What's yeah. company? You know, and so you'd have to go and see. And it was funny because sometimes if I had a message for him, I'd have to phone Browning's Books or someone else in the town and say, oh, could you just let George can you pop in? <laughs> yeah. go, and, go and tell him. And he had all the um, the community birth and death notices on, on the front of the shop. And, you know, so it's this kind yeah. of community spirit that, that is stopping well not stopping we've got a great community here but yeah yeah i, I think that if you keep worldly if you if you're going to keep active you keep active and keep active and work and work and work and that's that's what yeah. keeps you giving you purpose if, funny just to end that my my grandma and grandma were older than a lot of the people in the sure. uh, because they worked and they, uh -huh. uh, it's a weird dynamic but hey um uh -huh. I, I, can we um, just we'll just skip on through a few because I'd, okay. I'd like to talk okay. talk about another couple of um, that's of your projects. Yeah, and this is the male voice choir, Blenavon male voice choir. So I was kind of yeah. seeing awkward group portraits of them around town. You know, ones that people have quickly done after a gig. So I wanted to give them that kind of individual attention. Yeah. and you know can i offer them and i did not it took me three months to get hold of them in that tiny town because they didn't meet in the summer holidays so it was literally like a week before i left and wasn't going to come back with all my equipment um and they all they all came along they all came along my um, right. other half had driven to scotland with my softbox <laughs> in his car <laughs> i was like ah! So we borrowed one from Photo Gallery and lovely Louise took it and oh, sorry Louise, that was a big journey for her. Um, but I wanted to make an individual portrait of each of them to show them as a group, as a whole, but also to kind of chime their, their individuality. And they all picked a sheet of music that they liked and they all turned up in full uniform, even though I didn't ask them to. Brilliant. And I think they all thought I was a student until I had a solo exhibition with all the pictures. I've got Everyone, a, uh, yeah. we've got a great, great question here from Kirsten. I love how you tell the stories of the people. Are you ever tempted to record the stories of your yep. encounters? Mm -hmm. Always. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do that more and more now. And um, with the plot holders in Aberdeen, I did that. And I've done that a bit with the many residents. I wanted to make a film of them. But um, at the time, Anthony Baxter was making You've Been Trumped. And I was like, do you know, Anthony can do that much better than I can <laughs> I'll stick to the photography for this but yeah I think it's an important part of it because it's storytelling and yeah thank, yeah. thank you Kirsten Alicia can you just dip your screen a little bit for me just a tad yeah my screen yeah and just like, hey. not too much yeah yeah <laughs> that's a bit too much just uh just okay. up a little yeah that'll do that'll do that'll do. Okay. okay so yeah thanks so much for that Kirsten um, what we're going to do is um, we're, we're we're motoring on, okay, through this, and there is a big subject that I want to talk to you about, and I want to apply quite a bit of attention to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, look, what I would like to do is um, I'm going to I'm going to make a, a a quick choice here because this is the one I I really liked, and I just want to make sure I get the right one up on screen mm -hmm. for you. Was the digging for diamonds um, bunch of images and project. Mm -hmm. Okay, because what you did mention it briefly, um, mm -hmm. that you um, were using 
them as a uh sorry you were using um painting or paintings as a, a as a reference point so and i love mm -hmm. them so uh, i know that people be really interested because of uh, we do a lot of things with you know Pre like you said at the beginning you're a very different photographer so we we do a lot of stuff with social documentary and um reportage people and mm. um press photography and that kind of it's very different way of uh, looking and shooting stuff so mm -hmm. I, I know that people will be interested in how you apply yourself to to this what what you're thinking what how you're framing um, you know, maybe not so much mm -hmm. on on the kind of kit you use. And I, I do know that you shoot film, so well, the dig, dig, I do some digital as well, but mostly film. You do a mix, yeah. So yeah. Um, digging for diamonds. Let's go through that because uh, they they are fantastic. Digging for diamonds. So the name came up. I was doing a year long commission on rural allotments in Aberdeenshire, which are next to an art centre. So the land belongs to Crathis Castle and they get the land. It's like 50 quid a year for an allotment. It's so cheap. So yeah. it's it's democratic. And a lot of people, although they live in a rural location, don't necessarily have the land to to grow. So it was um, Nicola Henderson, so I was trying to remember, if you're there, hi, um, invited me from Wooden Barn and their gallery committee and they they applied to Creative Scotland for funding and they gave me a shed for the year, which I left unlocked so everyone could go in. It's a summer house shared shed in the, <laughs> in the allotments. And um, I had a full-time lecturing job at the time. So I would go up at the weekends and we would leave notes. And there's a guy, another photography person, David Officer, who used to work there. He would print out stuff and put up my notes for them. They would respond, people would leave things. Um, and I started, I was documenting the growing year and I was like, I really want to like meet everyone and sit and have a face to face chat with everyone to get my head around this place. So the best way was to go to each plot and like hover. It wasn't until May that anyone really appeared, got everyone's names, contact details. And then I made a pop up portrait studio over a couple of weekends and gave people an invite with a time. And if they wanted to come and photograph, be photographed, they could just come as they were, preferably in their mucky clothes and not all dressed up, but some got dressed up. And bring something to chat about and then I had a, some questions they would arrive Nicola another Nicola who worked there would give them a bit of cake and a coffee would sit and have a chat I would record a conversation and then I'd say right I've set up this this scene let's make a portrait and it was about them just bringing themselves to the to the whole so I set the stage and then they they're the characters they yeah they show me a side of them that they want to show and then there's there's a typology of portraits. Oh, Bunty as well. She was lovely. Bunty. She was so nice. Bunty, Brilliant. yeah. And um, I um, won't talk too much about technique, but I did um, use kind of valance to to soften the light. So the oh, okay. shed, so the shed became a bit like a a soft box, and you had to lift <laughs> lift this stick to come in. So it, it was an experience for them and for me. And Katie Rose and Kathy Val. Val owns um, a bistro on the site as well, so a lot of stuff comes from the plots. And if little kids pick fruit and veg, they bring them to Val and she'll give them cakes. Brilliant. So she, she brought dill and we put it in her hair. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. Sorry, my screen is a bit on the dip, so, yeah, I can see. Yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I love this so, stuff because John, it, um, <laughs> you, what you're getting is another is a collection there. You know, mm -hmm. what would you call an allotment owner? A, a plot holder. A plot, plot holder. P L O T, plot. A plot, right, okay. Frozen. Yeah. I've got, there's, there's, lot, there's lots of allotments near us, so I'm always intrigued about the people that go in and, and use allotments. <laughs> yeah, these are great. You know, very. Sorry, you went up. Oh, did I? Uh, yeah, I, I'm really intrigued by people that go to allotments and use allotments. Yeah. They're yeah, a certain type of per person, and I, I, I that really yeah. uh, intrigues his wife me. Made, his wife made him wear something clean. He came and he's like, well, my wife made me shave. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, and this guy, he set up Wooden Barn as well. He was one of the people that set it up, so they're responsible for making this community happen. Okay, so, um, right. Right. Okay. Right. 
Let's Am I talking that. too much? No, you're great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, let's talk Trump in golf. Oh, him. Yeah. You're so you like, <laughs> impatient. Gone. I was just like, I'm just taking it easy. I'm not being obvious. <laughs> and we wanted to talk about Alicia, but yes, we want to talk about uh, your amazing project. And that is, is it called the Meanie Project? Many, like men, many. Many projects. Or lots of, many. That's and, the name of the area, many. Okay, so is it many trumped on the, the many project? You introduce it because I'm going to get it up on the screen while um, we're while we're ch chatting. Many trumped. It used to be called, to start with, it was many a portrait of a Northeast community in conflict, <laughs> which was a much longer <laughs> name. And I've been looking a lot at Willie Doherty's work at that time. Um, oh, OK. But, but um, yeah, the more conversations I had with people and showed them the work and stuff like that, you know, I never want to have a photograph of Donald Trump in it, unless you ask me that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure, someone will again. But um, I felt like that that word had to be in it as well, you know, Trump. So, so that it instantly linked to the the problem, if you like. So uh, Grant Scott, he just says, "Sorry, just been chatting with Ian Sargent and thought he may have missed it. You haven't missed anything, Grant." Ah. Uh, is he in there? Anything. Hi, Ian. I just saw someone go Ian Sargent face. is uh, fantastic. I, I haven't met is, him. Yeah. I've spoken to him, but online. I've we met have, him. And, uh, oh, yeah. oh, great. Okay. And I've yeah. been buying his, uh, uh, his another books, books uh, which are really nice. Yeah. Uh, Ian so, went to see the Many Project when it was shown in Murray, at, um, Murray Art Centre. He went up to see it. So can you, I'll tell you what, let's start from the start. Wait, let's, let's start where, you know, did you get noticed that this was happening and you were compelled to do it because you're from Aberdeen? And mm -hmm. um, tell us how it came about because um, you were doing this a lot longer, way before it suddenly got on the map with, in terms of news and in the media. Um, yes and no. So 2006, the year I graduated, that's when Donald Trump first announced plans to build what he claimed would be the greatest golf course in the world. So that was 12. 12 years ago um, and because I'm from Aberdeen and because I'm up there a lot as well you know what what was being written and published in the local press compared to the international press was very different and I guess for me I was just curious about um, initially Michael Forbes the crofter who's in my portraits and I couldn't believe how he was being portrayed by the press and I thought there's something quite jarring here you know like mm. he can't just be this angry man shouting at, look he was the way he was reflected in the media didn't quite chime with me it made out like he lived on his own and all this kind of stuff and I think I just wanted to meet him to start with and I wanted to get my head around who he was and make a portrait of him so this is Mr Forbes is it Mike yeah Michael Forbes yeah and <laughs> went to his house um this is in 2010 I went to his house and I'd already at that point been offered an exhibition at Peacock Visual Arts in Aberdeen. Okay. And I'd applied for funding, an Aberdeen Visual Artists Award, where I said I wanted to look at social and political issues in the area. Mm -hmm. So I had, had a wee bit of funding. I'm just getting my charger. Um, and Because <laughs> I've just realised <laughs> my battery's low. Totally um, seamless. That was totally seamless. Don't worry. No one was, uh, no, no one will notice. No, no one's there. It's just us. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? So yeah, I went. I went to meet Mike, and I went to his house, and um, thinking that you know, oh, maybe they'll they'll just be him and his family and things like that. And he was having a party. He, it was like this um, group called Chipping Up Trump, who are fantastic, lovely campaigners, had set up an exhibition by an artist called David McHugh. And David was having, and if you've seen You've Been Trump, you'll know this, he was having an exhibition of paintings of Donald Trump and Mike in Mike's barn. And oh, there, were okay. hundred, there were hundreds of people there. There were people sleeping in tents, like making a festival out the weekend. It was such a lively, beautiful, happy atmosphere. And Mike was just like, hi, come in, have a drink, make yourself at home, you know, like his, we go to parties, family parties and stuff that they have now and stuff. Like, and it was just such a lovely community vibe. The other residents were there, you know, something really SHIT was happening to them. 
but they were i'm so sorry that's a message just came up on my screen um you know they couldn't have been nicer and his sisters and his his mum molly oh, I love molly so much they were just so welcoming and they fed us and you know everyone was checking that everyone was having a good time and david was talking about the context of his work and why he'd kind of made this it was like a checkmate chessboard in the middle and then trump and mike either side of each other, but an open view to the land, uh, which was right in the middle of Trump's land that he bought that Trump can't acquire. So it was, yeah, it was a lovely. And then through that, I met all of the residents, swap numbers and things like that. And we organ and I met Anthony Baxter there as well. He'd literally just started shooting you've been Trump. Yeah. Um, and Rowan Bates, all these wonderful people who are now friends. And um, yeah, just swap numbers with everyone and arrange to go back and meet everyone with my biscuits, obviously. <laughs> All these biscuits. Well, uh, can, um, we, can, we just re that. can we just Sorry. recap uh, a little my bit? Rambling. No, you're not. That's great. But I just want, if people aren't quite um, up to speed with the what, what the actual dynamic between him acquiring land and the, um, so I, I would call it aggressively acquiring land, yeah. And also aggressively um, bordering his neighbours and aggressively mm -hmm. renaming areas of it. And mm -hmm. um, but, however, at the same time, not being oh, resident there. He's still so, there. Oh, is there a situation where he'd, um, you know, that? I'm not sure if a lot of people quite understand, apart from the media point of view, and, mm -hmm. and maybe they hadn't seen you've been Trump, that yeah. um, that the how aggressive it was at the time because we uh, we only yeah we only saw a little bit of it. So it really mm -hmm. the the movie was great, and if you haven't seen the movie, you've been trumped. I mm -hmm. think might be on Netflix somewhere or Amazon, but you can definitely go and purchase the dvd for Anthony baxter yeah. i really i really recommend that they should show that on a weekly basis on on uh, on telly it was um, shown on the bbc about a year and a half after yeah that's right yeah i watched it again and i uh, well um and the, uh, and as you can see on the screen we've got michael forbes is here and yeah. um and sheila uh, and sheila and again we go back to the uh your your painting and your mm -hmm. uh, influence from arts could you explain to people a little bit further about how this came about because i um i thought oh uh, do you know what i was really jealous when you did it oh <laughs> because because <why>? it's <laughs> it's it's a brilliant it's a brilliant portrait right and the way oh, it's constructed you. and that kind of thing. but then i didn't i'm a uh, i'm an art idiot so i then didn't realize it was based on what you're going to explain to American us. Gothic. Yeah, yeah, American Gothic. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember meeting you and having this conversation in Fort Wayne yeah. Gallery. Um, <laughs> that feels like such a long time ago. Um, yeah, so the whole starting point for the exhibition, I was trying to get my head around what was happening. Overall, I was being followed by security, um, Trump security, whilst visiting them on their land, all this kind of thing. And I was making portraits in collaboration with each of the residents. And mm -hmm. I had shortlisted rural paintings and coastal paintings and lots of different artworks that were made in the northeast of Scotland or mm -hmm. had fishing connections and all that kind of stuff. And initially, Michael Forbes was going to be a William Dice painting. Now, William Dice is a the yeah. photo gallery um, yeah. called the Highland Ferryman, but we couldn't access his boat. Um, because it had been cordoned off by Trump and we were walking back. We we're gonna just go and see about doing a photo shoot there. And then um, Sheila was with us, Mike's wife, who's lovely as well. And I took a snap of them just on my digital camera. I was like, you know, maybe you're not an Aberdeen Art Gallery one. You look like a famous painting. And I showed them, it's not this, but a snapshot. And they were like, hi, oh, we can I eat. And they knew, we know that one. And they knew right away that it was, um, American got and I was like right I'm gonna get a postcard of it that's what we're gonna do so then a few days or weeks later I can't remember now we did that outside their house on a Saturday morning and yeah, yeah and they thought it was great because they knew that Trump would recognize the symbolism because it's American Gothic it was recently in an exhibition in the Royal Academy 
called America After the Fall, the painting was. Yeah. Um, so there's all these like historic connotations and connections and things like that. But in a more simple level, their home was under threat of compulsory purchase order. Um, Trump was saying that Mike was a village idiot, that he lived like a pig, that his home was a slum. He said absolutely horrible things about them on international news. They were, whilst working full-time jobs, having to defend themselves in the media quite a lot. And um, it gave them the opportunity to show their house and say, well, actually, we're quite proud of our house and yeah. our lifestyle and who we are. And they're, you know, they're people that are totally comfortable in their own skin. And we could all learn a lot from that. You know, they're yeah. happy with their lot. They're, so, yeah, and again, I didn't tell them what to wear. They chose what to wear. And Mike just happened to completely blend in with the house that day because he often wears, like, you call it in Aberdeen, a Gansey like a, a jumper, a fisherman's jumper, yeah. but it was a hotter day, so he wore the t-shirt and he decided that he would have the fork. I like that he's not wearing the Gansey actually, because it means you can see all his tattoos and stuff. Yeah, and... they're great, aren't they? I thought that, yeah. um, what uh, actually, funny enough, they I, f I found them very jovial on the screen. So when mm -hmm. they were being interviewed and that kind of stuff, the perception was that they were angry people and and that kind of stuff but actually the what what came across was actually they they were just very um you know very, well, yeah but they're very they're very scottish yeah <laughs> that's the only way i could put it so yeah uh, and the, but the the media perception of it via the trump pr mach machine was that mm -hmm. they were these awful people so you and know they're not at all they're, they're so nice and yeah, so it's important for me when in that situation, it would have been very easy to make a kind of straightforward documentary piece of work about that. But I wanted to kind of, for me, it's about getting to know people and the whole yeah. other side of it. But I wanted to represent them the same way that a painting would be shown in an art gallery, you know, that was filled yeah. with symbolism and was a tribute to them and something that had a bit more of a legacy for them, if that makes sense. Yeah. And to show them at a large scale in a gallery, but also to get the attention of like news desks and things like that. It meant they could get their side of the story across because all the portraits are accompanied by statements by them about how they felt about the situation. So the words, like Jim Mortram was saying in his interview, the words are theirs. And yeah. the image, they've had complete creative control over that with me being almost like a conduit, if you like, to, to make this picture together. And, and that is a complete, um uh the complete opposite from how or any training that i've had mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah, i come you're from, meant to be objective and you're yeah well i come from a press <laughs> press background and it is you, you get in get out you get in take pictures get out and I'm, and you never have that ability you're sorry you just don't have time which mm -hmm. sounds terrible but you but you don't have time really? to make a relationship yes, in the space of five or ten minutes you've got to come up with something really quick so the the way that you guys kind of approach that massive learning curve sorry i didn't i didn't hear that because you sort of slowed down and went all robotic ah right okay so the <laughs> the, the difference is that um I've come from a, a completely opposite background to that. So mm -hmm. learning from that kind of process and that uh, relationship building and talking and, and that kind of thing is, it, it is refreshing. And I, mm -hmm. I assume that a lot of people that watch will watch this and, and come from that kind of, um, you know, you've got to be right quick in people's faces, taking pictures and all the rest of it mm -hmm. um, should actually come second to actually having a chat with them first. And I know that doesn't work in street mm -hmm. photography before everyone jumps up and down and goes mental. But um, <laughs> I think that, that it sometimes it, it needs to be. You need to stand back a bit and and, uh, um, and actually approach people. Can we just talk about these yeah. um, the marker posts? Because this was quite mm -hmm. a significant part of it. Can you run us run us through that? Kirsten had... Uh, made a, a point that actually they were they were actually skinny trumps with his red top hair there you go so um <laughs> yeah listen in on on that because that seems to be at the beginning of the project so also, it's quite aggressive of the trump turnberry project that is trump many trump, many trump turnberry's at the other side of scotland yeah um but that's okay yeah he's got two i think it, it's deliberately confusing sometimes um yeah so I had a map that I got from Deborah Storr, a local councillor, of the 
the development where I'm sure you've got the map there on the screen. I should have looked. I have. Hold on actually. one second. I, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get that. Let's let's go through it. Uh, let's go through it. There we go. I should have got my copy out of the map. So there you can go. see a lot of this hasn't been built. The housing hasn't been built. Um, but you've got he wanted to have Trump Avenue there and then the, the hotel complex and all these sorts of things. And I spend a lot of time when I'm doing a project, a personal project, getting to know an area really. And this area, I forgot to say for me is a personal one because I used to play on that beach as a little girl. I've oh, been okay. going to that beach since since I was tiny wee. And so it means a lot to me playing on those sand dunes. And Mickey Foote, who lived in many said as well, I used to play commandos on those dunes. You know, it's it's a really significant area in Aberdeen. But what Trump had proposed to do was name it all after himself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> having things like roundabout near where David and Moira Milne's house, Trump Avenue. And you can see the residents' houses here. So if you see, there's the coast and then you go in a bit and then there's a kind of like almost a cross shape with black and that's Mill of Many. In the centre, if you go down, I can't see your arrow, below the hotel, that's Mill of Many there. That's okay. Mike's. That's Mike's land, so it's bang in the middle of the land that Trump has purchased. And all the residents' houses are on there, but there's also all these numbers in the sort of purple yellow bit, which um, I started to notice these plastic posts just appearing, you know, over weeks. And I was like, well, what are these? And at the time, it was still a kind of an untouched dune system, apart from these posts appearing. So then it, it became clear quite quickly that that was going to be the golf the golf holes and the golf greens and things like that. So I tried to make a piece of work, I guess, which was a bit conceptual, but also like mapping and tracking the, the wilderness before it was effectively trumped and changed. I mean, now it's all like bright green, slightly blue golf, you mm. know, golf mm. course. So mm. you can start to see in um, 18, 17, 16, 15, you can start to see the bulldozers. So this, bottom row, third along in the bottom row, you can start to see the bulldozers coming in. But all the images I shot um, looking north from the same distance, yeah. a, wee, a wee kiss of flash, and it took from one o'clock in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night to get to them all because, you know, it wasn't a walkable golf course at the time. It was a wilderness slash building site. Um, yeah. And yeah, making all the pictures whilst also hiding from security. Security seemed to knock off at 12 on a Saturday, which is why I did it on a Saturday. Um, <laughs> so I mean, hey, let, let's just go over that again. So I, I, I wasn't aware that um, you personally were being you you were uh, dodging, you were dodging the security and that kind of thing a little bit. And that kind of way, well, I was I wasn't breaking the law, but yeah. they would have prevented me from completing my conceptual project. That I wanted no, to I do. understand. So, yeah. So to make life easier for my photographs and to shoot it all in one day, I mean, you can see how much the weather changes in a day in the northeast of Scotland. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I picked my time where I knew I wasn't causing any obstruction. I knew I wasn't breaking the law or doing anything bad, but I wanted to kind of, like, for me, it was important to make my series. So that was yeah. how I did it. And you can see by the 18th hole that it's dark. So that's August, 10 o'clock at night in August facing north um, and then so the exposures are the same but the background gets darker so yeah. then it kind of it brings it all together like an ordnance survey I think yeah. of, of I the landscape and it gives me the opportunity if I wish to to go back and be photograph that landscape. So just got a, a comment here from Claudette Bruce you talk about your work in cities with such warmth and love. Oh and thank you. It's very inspiring. I swear we're not related. I don't think we are. <laughs> Thank I don't, you I'm very not, much. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if I if I keep, I'm going to keep browsing through the selection, and if you can, mm -hmm. because I can see then that there, but by, by this image, then that the the mm -hmm. site is beginning to. This is sort of around the time that they're they're beginning to mark out the holes. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, so this is the holes in the greens. Oh, they're that. there. The golf course is there. So you're looking towards yeah. the 18th hole there on the right hand side. Got you. Yeah. Um, and then if you look, I think the 18th hole was meant to be where all those fences and rubbish are, but because of the the wetness of the land, there was a young forest there that they ripped up. It's in another one of my photographs, and um, they've just been dumping things there. But you can see. 
because the golf course is treated with this stuff to make it look very, very green. And there's yeah. a lot of water as well yeah. um, involved. So you can see how the golf course looks very, although a golf course you think is meant to be like natural materials, outdoor, you know, people being healthy. But this is, this doesn't quite sit well in this environment somehow. Yeah, it or for me anyway. Uh, a Lynx course, isn't it? So you got, um, obviously there's a lot of sand and, marshland and that kind of thing so it's not an actual mm -hmm. natural that's not a natural fairway yeah and nature's fighting back as well because it, yeah. it was a mobile sand dune system it was a site of special scientific interest and protected you know i think and you've been trump jim jim hansen he called it the um scotland's equivalent if you like of the amazon rainforest and it's meant to be protected because it's an area of outstanding natural beauty i just want to clear something up Claudette uh, <laughs> Merida Bruce, he's from Aberdeenshire too. Maybe he's related. Oh, uh, like maybe. That. Well, we're definitely not directly related, but we'll have a chat about that later. So, yeah, behind. So <laughs> who, you, who do we have here? This is Moira and David Milne. So, the picture I was just talking to you about, see behind Moira, yeah. behind her watering can, a yeah. young wood has just been ripped up that day. Okay, yeah. And, She's holding the watering can as a kind of subversion symbol to say, well, trees drink a lot of water. What do you think is going to happen to that land? Do you know, if you suddenly rip out what's pulling up the water, she didn't think they would be able to build anything on that land. And she was right, because these people know that landscape, like the back of their hands, they've lived there for decades. They're in the old Coast Guard's cottage, and now their house is surrounded by trees. They can't see this viewpoint. And then behind her, there's that wee bit of sand on the dune system, do you yeah. see? Yeah. And I used to say that was like a heart, and they call it Alicia's heart. Because <laughs> I'd always be like the heart, because for me, although it's walking through the golf course now, you would go down from their house, past Susan Minow's house, and towards that to get on the beach. That was the easiest the easiest way to get and, on the beach. And is that, uh, 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 is that blocked off now? You can't circumnavigate that to get down um, <laughs> Very difficult. Legal, legally you can, but sometimes you can be prevented. I've been stopped by Trump security. I've been frog marched off the, the land. I've been threatened by Trump security. Um, but apparently, you know, we've got a right to roam in Scotland for ramblers. Yeah. You know, you should be able to access the landscape. So, yeah, but outside Susan and John Munoz's house now, there's a huge fence and it's surrounded by gorse and, it's, it, and a big bund of earth. And trees all built up, so all the lights blocked from the house. But it's not an easy, <laughs> yeah. an easy access to get no, onto I there. I, I understand. I understand mm -hmm. with that. So, yeah. you, what what do we have here? We've got. Was this the avenue that you were talking about? So this again, you could see this from David and Moira's house. So this this isn't Trump, Trump Avenue. Doesn't exist. That was on the developer plans and the kind of the. Yeah. The plans that the Scottish government overturned after it was rejected by Aberdeenshire Council. Um, but these are just like tarmac roads that go all through the golf course. But to me, I see that it looks to me like a little kid has just scrawled a pen, you know, yeah. through through a photograph. It, it looks so unnatural and jarring. So I was always photographing this black tarmac path as it was appearing. It was slightly bluey black and yeah, yeah, and really odd and jarring with the landscape. So. Again, it's trying to show, you know, Trump was saying he was going to make that it environmentally well. perfect and <laughs> all this kind of stuff because he says he's an environmentalist. So it was all going to be, and he thought he was like an artist of this landscape. But I'm kind of trying to expose how unnatural it what is. Did he, what did he rename the... Um, the, great June, the Great Dunes of Scotland. Wasn't it the Great Dunes of Scotchland? Maybe, probably. Well, he says he's Scotch. Exactly. He's Scotch. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 in you being a Scotch person, not only is he, and especially from Aberdeen, and find this reasonably offensive as it is, but it's oh, when, he, when he, um, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah. When he, when he talks, um, and you guys being from Aberdeen would find that highly offensive as it is, that, even me as an English person, I get, like cringe every time he says something that is, that, especially something. about yeah, the renaming <laughs> of it. So he, he not, we wouldn't do that because it's hideous, but it's like mm -hmm. the great dunes of Scotchland, you know, and when he kind of says it and my mom's from Scot 
Scotch yeah. Land and others, and you kind of like sat like, oh, like what, what the hell, you know? And I can imagine, you know, the the raging Scots uh, going crazy about that kind of stuff. But I, it's just even on a language level, he's he's yeah. offensive. Well, it was funny in the northeast of Scotland, and um, you know, there was a big fanfare for Trump to start with. There were, you know. Yeah. Obviously, the local residents, before they even knew Donald Trump had acquired the land, they had people inquiring about their homes and it all seemed a bit off. And, and so mm. they worked it out quite quickly. But um, the local news in Aberdeen was very pro-Trump. Very pro-Trump. In fact, I've got a book yeah. here written by a journalist, David, David Ewan, who worked for Aberdeen Journals Limited, and it's called Chasing Paradise. So Donald Trump and the battle for golf course and it's got a picture of Mike but what I really love is the, the sticker as well so <laughs> I got this for part of my archive so and it's published by the um it says black and white publishing but it was commissioned by the local newspaper in Aberdeen so it's like a, a complete pro-Trump book um yeah. which obviously didn't become a bestseller but Paradise is the name of Mike Forbes's mum's house Molly's house is called Paradise yeah so yeah so, mm -hmm. and yeah, Donald Trump's executive vice president was married to the editor of the local newspaper. So the way the residents were written about was shocking. It was it was heartbreaking, actually, you know, because it's kind of you're talking about Aberdeen being annoyed with this. And obviously a lot of people were. But to start with, you know, it was turning people against their own if that makes any sense. So Mike and yeah. Sheila and Susan worked for Aberdeen Journals as well. Um, yeah, they were they were vilified by their own local newspaper. And it, it was always, the headlines were always aggressive, you know, Trump opponent rather yeah. than local local man or local crofter or local fisherman, you know, and that kind of thing, Trump enemy. Well, that was and, when Salmon yeah. was involved as well and, and basically had, um, well, uh, fell on his sword in the end, didn't he? Because of the way that mm -hmm. well, public, public, uh, public, the public turned against him about about that and the and the behaviour pattern around, especially around money, and the greed mm -hmm. aspect of it, which was which was terrible. Yeah, I've got I've got. Um, I met Alex Almond and spoke to him about about this as well because they're also his constituents. So I brought this exhibition to the Scottish Parliament during Scottish Envi Environment Week. Okay. And it was important for me to, um, you know, if he wasn't going to go to their doorsteps, I had to go to his doorstep, which was, you know, the parliament. So before First Minister's question time, he had no choice but to walk past and see them face to face. Um, and then he came to find me and was very charming, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but he did. He met Mike the following day. He went and met, but in Inverurie, in his office, not in not at Mike's house, he's never been to their doorsteps and he was their MSP. He's not just the First Minister, he was the, their member of the Scottish Parliament for that area, that's his yeah. constituency. Yeah. So, yeah, so that exhibition, he was my target audience. You know, Alex Salmond was the, the key target audience and the policy makers. Absolutely crazy, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. And I got a photo of him, he asked, when I started asking questions, he was like, would you like would you like your photograph? Would you like your photograph taken with the first minister? And he beckoned over this photographer, Andrew, that worked at Parliament, got photos of us, you know, like PR cell. And I said, Well, can I take a photo of you as well? And then, yes, yes, of course. And you know, in my comments book, you know, great photographs, <laughs> Alex <laughs> Salmon. And he was saying, you know, oh, Molly, she's just like someone's mum, isn't she? She's so lovely. Oh, she's just and oh, it's great that they're fighting for Scotland. He went on a big kind of how he wasn't friends with Donald Trump pretty much and this kind of thing. And then I said, well, can I take a photo of you? Can you just look at Mike and Sheila? Like, just, you know, look at him. And I wanted a photo where Alex Salmond was almost looking them in the eye. Yeah. That was the whole point of taking that picture. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like, you know, that charm and charisma that someone has, if you didn't know the backstory, it, yeah. Yeah, it's self, Shame. self, self, self the whole time. Yeah, yeah. it was good that they had in the in the news with him anyway. Ultimately, yeah. So I was pleased that on, on that occasion, you know, Mike and Alex Salmon got to meet up and and discuss it. But the 
and Salmon wrote in letters as well, but it kind of, it trailed out eventually, you know, that kind of, that chat, because they, they feel betrayed by him. Yeah, okay. yeah, of course they would be, yeah. So here, is this, mm -hmm. um, what are they destroying here, Alicia? <laughs> That's the Blairton <laughs> burn, and they're, they're damming the burn. They're trying to stop the flow of water that's coming through the burn towards the sand dunes and onto the beach. And the reason for that is one of the kind of championship tees of the golf course has started falling apart um, okay. because, of, because of the flow of water. And it started to collapse in like this really big, probably bigger than this room. I've got a picture of it as well. Um, so they're try I think what they're trying to do is kind of slow the flow of the water to minimise the damage of the golf course. Yeah. Because <coughs> nature's fighting back. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's just absolute insanity. And this, yeah, this that's, is another, that's, that's, a, that's a, a, another view of it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so that's from the top of one of the sand dunes onto it. And you can see, if you look at the traffic cones, that gives you a sense of scale Yeah. as well. Um, but this was meant, this is the part of the golf course that you can view from the beach, from the public area on the beach. I've got you. Um, yeah. <coughs> which is meant to be like one of the beautiful shots and, and that sort of thing. But that was six months after it opened, and it was a week before my exhibition at the Scottish Parliament. So I got these pictures, processed them, got them scanned, and then street level printed them big, like 30 by 30 inches, so that I had it right outside the members' lobby of the Scottish Parliament, and the government had to walk past it every right. day for a week. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the, the greatest golf course in the world. Now this is uh, Michael Ford's mother, is that right? Molly. Yeah, that's Molly. Yeah, and um, actually it's based in my office. That's based on To Pastures New, which is a Glasgow Boys painting. Got you. See it? Yeah. I don't know if I'm full screen or if I'm portrait. No, you are um, your split screen at the moment. I'm split screen. So this is To Pastures New, and um, Molly has always loved this painting, and it kind of captures her girl-like spirit and her optimism. Um, so we made this portrait of her on her land with her geese um, and we were stopped by Grampian police making the photograph because really? they drove down from behind where Molly is which is Trump's land all the way down all the way to the gate because Sheila and Mike were there as well <coughs> and so was my other half. Um, Mike was keeping the horse entertained and Sheila was kind of guiding the geese with a bag of brioche <laughs> and I was taking pictures and you know Molly was in her 80s then she's in her 90s now so it's kind of gently getting the composition and then we got stopped and the police said they heard there'd been unusual activity in the area put your camera away and yeah and mike was like she's not doing anything wrong she's she's on her land she's taking a photo of my mother fits your problem yeah and yeah but they didn't want me to photograph them because they said it wasn't an official visit but i did anyway um, yeah yeah they're rightly so yeah. i mean you don't need permission for, for something yeah. like that. So, I mean, it, I learned a lot about the law in terms of photography, copyright. Once the image is made, it's made, you know what I mean? No one's got a right without a warrant to tell you to pull your film out or delete your... You know this because you're a press photographer. Yeah, yeah. But this work was all made around about the same time as that I'm a photographer, not a terrorist campaign. Yeah, oh, right, yeah, it was, um, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, which was great because then I had to stop and search. I never pulled them out, but I had them in my... Bag and I always felt like that was my my reassurance, you know, that I'm, I was keeping myself right and within the law. Um, but it doesn't stop, you know, it doesn't stop them trying to stop you taking photographs. Well, no, and uh, in, in fact, you bringing that up with the <coughs> right, what the rights are surrounding copyright, and actually um, also in terms of where you are standing on public land and public property, and etc., etc., etc. Is, no, it's private um, land. It's Mike's land. Oh, Mike's land. I, I'm, even yeah. even your own private land. The uh, yeah, um, and I'm a guest. people think that they can spout what the laws are. You know, mm -hmm. spout the the laws that they think they are when they they don't even know it. And I think that's a common problem mm -hmm. with lots of photographers out there for sure. Yeah. Well, that's that is uh, that is fantastic, Alicia. We have uh, really shot over time quite easily yeah we have great. we have and, uh, i talk a lot sorry yeah it's really good <laughs> it's really good and uh, can you tell us a little bit about your that you you're shooting or are just about to produce the zero tolerance work 
Yeah, so that's been launched later this year. That was um, a commission. It's 25 years since the original campaign to end men's violence against women in Scotland, which was an amazing, amazing, I remember it from primary school, campaign, which made the public aware that this wasn't going to be put up with anymore. And there were these big, show you, this is from a workshop. So it's been scribbled all over. But the Z was really important, a really uncompromising letter. And then the photographs that Frankie Raffles took were very soft. They could almost be like tableau family photographs, but the statements yeah. like this from three to 93 women are. It was to, to educate the one. <laughs> and then I've got hundreds of these up in my office just now, end male protection bracket. So I was commissioned to make a new body of work looking at kind of, you know, kind of more hidden aspects of men's violence against women now. So not only looking at the kind of general, you know, people see domestic violence as a woman being punched in the face in her home by a drunk man. You know, there's these perceptions or that the man's lost control rather than the fact he's just he's attacking someone and it's not about losing control um but also you know there's things that happen to transgender women diane abbott i photographed she gets told more than any other mp mm -hmm. in the uk um she's been a member of parliament for 30 years and the amount of abuse she gets is unbelievable so i included her a woman who's gone through female genital mutilation as a child um all these other patriarchal forms of men it's not comfortable to listen to, but that's the point. You know, mm. it's not comfortable and it's, it's less comfortable for people that are going through these things. So I collaborated with lots of women from all walks of life, transgender women, um, yeah, women with learning disabilities. So have you have you completed the project? Who, I've taken all the pictures, yes, and they're yeah. gonna be exhibited. So you're working at putting, your, putting all that together at the moment, soon. I suppose. Yeah, and they're making a little publication at the moment as well. And yeah, you'll hear about it very, very soon. And, and where, hoping... where can we send people to go and have a look at it? Is it online at all? No, none of the images have been published yet. They're all Not yet. So it's where, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to suggest to people, right? If they no. look up Zero Tolerance, or if they look at my Twitter, I'll announce it on Twitter, Instagram, my website. Maybe, right, I'll or... tell you what we're going to do. All right, we're going to do this first. Um, if you guys want to follow Alicia on um, Insta, it's on that. Let's do this is better. And uh, also, you can see some of the work in progress if you scroll right down my Instagram account as well. Let's just do this because um, what I want people to do is Go follow you. Right. Instagram. Instagram.com forward slash Alicia Booth photo. Photo. Yeah. And go and not and the other one. The other one is photos. You don't want to follow my other no, one. Just, just <laughs> on this one. Alicia, one. Yeah. Alicia Booth photo. Okay. Alicia Booth photo mm -hmm. on uh, this is on Instagram and on Twitter. Right, where you can go and interact with her and talk to her. <laughs> really, not that you can't on Instagram, but it's a slightly different dynamic. <laughs> Yeah. is um this let's put that up on the screen she is twitter.com uh, and it would be at picture making picture making okay go and yeah. go and find her on twitter and go and say hi and have a bit of a chat and um and uh, find out a little bit more from her um because uh, obviously we've we've uh, been speaking for an hour and that's fantastic but if you want to continue the conversation go and say hello to her go and follow her on twitter and insta and then you you you're there yeah, you're there you're making a connection so if you're a scottish mm -hmm. person who wants to go and hang out with her in edinburgh go and stay at her house <laughs> anything like that yeah. <laughs> everybody's kids end up in our garden just bring yeah that's all right yeah uh, there's a, there's a few yeah. messages here let's just go through okay. those quickly Carol. so there are people Carol. watching oh mum very proud of you there we go she's related to me Ashley, <laughs> that's my there auntie <laughs> there you go your family's wrong is there anything so, yeah, that I'm uh, not related to there? 
So look, thanks so much for for taking part in this. Um, Thank you. These do go up on on YouTube as well. So if people do want to watch them back, they can watch them back on our Facebook on the Facebook page or on uh, via YouTube quite easily. And uh, yeah, thanks so much again, Alyssa. And the next and place I should say as well a shout out to Julie Graham, a curator dot com. She's publishing the work, so she's New York based. So uh, that'll be okay. the next edition of the work. Will be on her online magazine. So hi Julie, if you're there as well. And then, and then when this all comes through, we'll get get you back on so we can talk about the project and have a look about it online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I just mention one? I've got an exhibition opening in Edinburgh next week, which I haven't spoken about, ah. which is um, for Edinburgh World Heritage. So I've made portraits of people who who live and work in the World Heritage site, including like people. Sunny, Sunny's awesome. Um, so. Sonny's from Invisible Edinburgh, and he's an ex-homeless tour guide who gives okay. a kind of crime and, punishment, um, crime and punishment vibe about the city, and tourists come and go on tours of Edinburgh with him. So I got commissioned to photograph all these people who live and work in the bones of Edinburgh. It's not like Venice, which is, you know, all the people have been pushed out, and locals have been pushed out. Edinburgh's a living city, so it's a World Heritage exhibition, but I've made some portraits, so if you're in portraits, you might, might like it. Don't Where know. can we see them again? The Tron Kirk on the Royal Mile. So the it's Tron like Kirk. Okay. Tron Kirk. So it's being redeveloped at the moment to become this heritage hub. But it's the one with the big spire halfway down the Royal Mile and on the bridges. You'll yeah. know it. I know where it is. I yeah. know where it is. Okay, well that sounds fantastic. Love so you. look, we will catch up again. Um What we'll was that? I lost you there. We'll catch up again, and uh, we will go over um, the the newer exhibition when it's going to come out. If that's all right. Cool. Yeah. Good thank stuff. you. Okay. Thanks ever so much. For, <laughs> thanks ever so much for what you're taking part, and uh, yeah, uh, do uh, do make sure that you follow us and share these videos. That really helps us out. All right. Thank you. So, thank um, you, everyone, for watching. For thanks again.